coming up on One Detroit. The whole point is so that we can better serve our citizens. Meet the woman leading the charge to bring Detroit's information and technology into the future while making it accessible for people across the city. I sit down with Detroit CIO Beth Niblock. Also ahead, author Alan Malik talks urban revival here and around the country with Stephen Henderson. And we'll catch up with Nolan and Stephen at the Black Lotus Brewery in Clawson for the biggest stories making headlines this week. I'm Christy McDonald. One Detroit is coming up. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at strongermichigan.com. Support also provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and the Bill and Shirley Fox Fund for Leadership and Public Affairs Programming at Detroit Public TV. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. We're in Clawson this week and meeting up at the Black Lotus Brewery on Main Street. We have a full show coming your way, including my interview with Detroit CIO Beth Niblock. You'll hear how her team has worked the past five years to bring the city online, connect residents to services faster, and be transparent. Plus, Stephen talks with author Alan Malik about equality in urban revival, and we'll catch up with Nolan Finley and Stephen as we take on some of the biggest stories this week, including a new report out on what Detroit really needs to succeed from Detroit future city, and some push-pull between Governor Whitmer and the legislature. So say hello to Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal. We're sitting down here in Clawson. Again, I, I feel like we should have something different in our glasses and our mugs at a brewery. But, uh, it's the brewery's Clawson's not open yet. a pretty nice little place. It is. It is. It's got a nice little Main Street here. Mm -hmm. Good downtown. 14 in Liberty. Good right. restaurants. And this looks really like cool it would be a fun place to come to here. Yeah. This black so, dinner. yeah, it's nice to get out and about a little bit. A lot of stuff going on this week. It's funny when I, I text you guys saying, all right, what do you want to talk about? We usually kind of have some of the same things on our on our minds yeah. that have been happening. And one of the things was the, the report that came out from Detroit Future City. And mm -hmm. I think it's kind of interesting how Detroit Future City has morphed over the last, you know, nine years mm -hmm. in terms of what kind of information they're bringing out about about the city and kind of what it takes for the city to succeed, Stephen. Yeah, yeah I think uh, I, I've talked with Anika Goss Foster about this before. Uh, they want to be the ones who sort of set the table for what the city looks like now and what it might look like in the future. They don't want to make the decisions. They don't want to uh, sort of advocate for, for one choice or another, but to sort of lay out what those choices look like based on the demographics, uh, based on the decisions that we've made before. And they've actually done a really good job, I think, of adapting to that space uh, rather than the, the sort of strict planning space that I, they kind of started in. Right, and, and Nolan, when mm -hmm. you see this report come out talking about growing the middle class, specifically yeah. the black middle class in the yeah. city of Detroit, when you look at the numbers and the disparity of only 25% of the population mm -hmm. is middle class in the city and the region-wise, you're looking at about 38%. What stood out for you in, in looking at that? Well, if you think about it, Detroit was the place where the middle class was born. You know, the $5 workday, Henry Ford's uh, uh, $5 workday and the auto plants, mm -hmm. that started the middle class in America. And this, if you look around at these neighborhoods, these were all middle class neighborhoods. And now 
there's only 25 middle class neighborhoods left out of 250 some in the city. It's, it's like 10% uh, of the city's population or city's neighborhoods are middle class, only 25% of the population. It really speaks to the challenges ahead for the city in creating a diverse economic base. Yeah, when you frame those challenges though, then you also start to look at, okay, what are some of the solutions to this, which is a, a, a large kind of systemic yeah. shift of, of jobs and education. Right, uh, so, so I, I saw a lot of my life sort of unfolding in this report. Oh, I mean, how so? Uh, so, I mean, I grew, grew up here in the 70s and 80s, at a time when Detroit was not just the home of the middle class, but the home of the black middle class mm -hmm. and this emerging, uh, very stable middle class that populated the city through much of the late 70s and 80s and into the 90s. This report shows how that has been dismantled by a number of different factors. Uh, one of them is depopulation, right? Most mm -hmm. of the black middle class left the city in the 2000s, uh, but the people who were here also got a lot poorer. Uh, neighborhoods like the neighborhoods where I grew up uh, are in much worse shape now. The people who've been there for a long time don't have the things that they had. Uh, the neighborhood where I was born over on the west side was one of the places that African Americans were first allowed to buy houses uh, in the city of Detroit in the early 60s. Uh, the investments that those families made in real estate should be worth way more today than they are. Now they're worth less than they paid back then. Um, and Detroit Future Study actually studied, and I think it was last year, they took a look at the number of homeowners versus the renters, mm -hmm. and the renters mm -hmm. have now outweighed the homeowners Absolutely. as well. Uh, we, we've lost all of that investment capital that we had, not just for African Americans, for everybody, but uh, the African American inflection of that really stands out in a city that again, uh, birthed the black middle class in a way that other cities did not. So how, go ahead, Nolan. So you need, according to this report, 33,000 more middle class households in Detroit to bring it up to the national average. Uh, and you have a lot of neighborhoods on the verge of, of middle class. Mm -hmm. And what this report said, one of the largest obstacles, other than the ones we think about, schools and crime, one of the largest auto um, obstacles is auto insurance. If we could solve that issue and you would bring more middle class families in and keep more middle class families and you know i think that informs the current debate on what we do with no fault insurance yeah. oh and that's and that's percolating right now too. yeah it is yeah. uh it's also a question though of what do you do to move the people who are still here in the city into the middle into class that. okay uh, and, and those are two different questions, right? Can you attract people back is one issue. Can you do better by the people who are here is another one. And I, I think a tougher one, uh, in fact, to, to crack, you, you, can't, you can't solve the problem without doing either one of them, though. Uh, if, if, as long as you have as many people without opportunity living in the city as you do, we're not going to get to where we would need to go no matter how many people we bring back. So I, I, I love when you look at this and you say, okay, so Detroit Future City kind of frames and gives people the numbers and says, okay, look, this is what we, where we need to get to. So then the actionable thing is, so who then picks up this report, Nolan, and says, okay, what can we do with this to actually start, start to change the Well, things? I think it dovetails nicely with this strategic neighborhood initiative that the mayor and the business community and the foundations have going this $125 million to revive 12 neighborhoods to create commercial strips, to create anchors so you can restore neighborhoods around the commercial strips. I think these two, these two um, initiatives have worked very nicely together because it does identify, this, this report identifies neighborhoods that are on the cusp and so you know that investment uh, if you can shore up and provide anchors for neighborhoods, you can both keep people and bring people back in. What do you yeah. think? Uh, you've got to do that. You've got to fix opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, not just schools, but opportunity to get to work, to acquire skills mm -hmm. that uh, put you in the middle class permanently as opposed to temporarily. Um, and you've got to deal with, this is something that we don't talk enough about in Detroit, you've got to deal with the growing isolation that a lot of these neighborhoods are beset by. There are people who live in these places who don't have the means to get to any place else. So unless you're going to grow jobs in their neighborhood, 
they can't, they can't take an there. advantage. But, yeah. You know, there's billions of dollars being invested in Detroit right now. That's enough money to create and stabilize a middle class in the city if we have people trained and ready to take yeah. those jobs. And if you can, once they get those jobs, if you can keep them in the city. Yeah, yeah you know, because right. the, the if they out, don't leave. outward they don't migration leave. hasn't stopped. Yeah. yeah. All right, putting the money in the right place. All right, let's talk a little a little politics. Um, uh, Governor Whitmer's making mm -hmm. some moves, and he she kind of nixed a deal this week for an <laughs> in immigration center to buy the Ionia, uh, the prison in Ionia. Um, that was interesting, Nolan. Uh, that well, kind of popped up on your radar. It was also boneheaded. I mean, it's why do you think it was boneheaded? Well, one, we've um, Ionia is one of those count counties who've been hit hard by the loss of their core industry, which is prisons. You've had two prisons closed there in over the last decade or so this would have brought back 300 jobs uh, restored this eyesore to use put it on the tax rolls for the first time it was something this community was looking forward to and the reasoning to kill the this, this project was Whitmer didn't think detaining immigrants was reflected Michigan values well here's a clue those immigrants are already being detained they're in county jails all over the state where they're mixed with criminals, mixed with others, this would have put them in a more humane environment uh, and would have, would have brought economic um, opportunity back to that community. It was, it, she allowed her personal sort of politics and ideology to trump good policy. Well, or, or was it a morality stand in terms of they couldn't guarantee Absolutely. that they were not going to be separating families? Right. They, so already said, right. they already are. They already are. These and, people are already detained. But the idea of exacerbating that or doubling down on it for How the so? benefit of Michigan uh, jobs or whatever. Also, so, they're already being so detained, hold on, Steve. Hold on. Uh, the idea of growing our economy on the backs, first of all, of more prisons, which uh, is part of the problem here in Michigan, is that we spend more on prisons already than we do on education, uh, and the idea of indulging the current uh, administration's immigration policies, which are not moral. And I don't think that's just an ideological position, that's a moral position. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a governor who's elected by the people of this state to take that position and say, we don't want to be She's part of that. hurting the people of the state with this. These are folks who are already detained. Doesn't it increase the number yeah. of detentions? Uh, you know, it does put them in a more orderly setting, take him out of the county jail. Aiding and abetting uh, the, and these the immigration were, policy is not... That it, uh, you're not changing, is, is you're not not changing a, the immigration policy and it's not... You're not changing it, but helping. she's saying not here. Right. Well, but it is here. We're not going to do they're it. They're in our county jails. So let's not pretend they're not being detained. But this would have uh, uh, made permanent right. our role. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't, it change, sure, absolutely. wouldn't it change a thing. These people would have still been detained. This way, they're detained in a more orderly yeah. way, apart from so when you the see regular injustice, jail population. Rather than saying, we don't want to be part of that, and it shouldn't be happening, we, we say, are well, part where's, of that? Our, where's our we're benefit our part in of that. the they're injustice? They're in our county jails. I, they probably shouldn't be there either. Well, they are. But the point so is, we're not fixing why, anything. why make we're just, that worse? We're just making bad policy yeah. and cheating. Um, cheating Michigan, a Michigan compute, yeah, community of economic opportunity and jobs. All right, well, we're going to take it up, hopefully, with the governor next week when uh, she joins us on the show. But I want to move real quick. You spoke with um, author Alan Malik this week. I he did. came into town talking about urban revival and some of the keys to that, and specifically looking at Detroit. Yeah, uh, it dovetails nicely, nicely with this DFC report uh, about the death of the middle class in the city. Uh, he, he is really looking at the ways in which uh, this revitalization that's taking part in some places in the city is not reaching most people. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look. There are signs of revival in downtown and in some neighborhoods, but yet the crux of the problem is that Detroit is still the poorest large city in the United States, and there are hundreds of thousands of people who live in this city who basically are pretty much excluded from any real benefit from the revitalization, who typically don't have access to the jobs, still don't have access, for the most part, to decent education opportunities. And so this is really the crux of the problem. How can a city like Detroit revive and provide a better life for the people who are here already. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's happening in a lot of cities 
is that downtowns, if you go back 100 years, except for Philadelphia for some reason, hardly anybody lived in U.S. In downtown. downtowns. Yeah. They were non-residential places. And now they're all turning into residential neighborhoods. As you know, you have people converting these 1920s office buildings and industrial buildings and so forth. And so are they going to continue to be com the city's shared space? I think it's Detroit, I see it as a particularly intense issue, both because the, de the redevelopment of downtown, I think in large part because of the amazing infusion of money mm -hmm. from Dan Gilbert from and person, his right? partners, yeah. has moved ahead much faster than any change in the rest of the city's neighborhoods. So it's really, while it, at one level, it's great. I mean, who is against seeing all of these empty office buildings sure. being brought back and people actually walking at night on Woodward Avenue and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it runs the risk of, in a strange sort of way, actually exacerbating the division. How do we convince either private investors, philanthropy, or government uh, to value these neighborhoods as much as they do these other places? Well, I think the first part is just say, convince them that this is important, that the whole question of equality and inclusion are fundamentally important to the future of this city, as well as, broadly speaking, to the United States. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second part is we're not talking about huge amounts of money. While I was researching my book, I spent time with people in Baltimore and Minneapolis who are doing uh, both from doing amazing things in terms of workforce programs that integrate these different pieces, education, legal disabilities, psychological empowerment, and so forth. And I asked both of them, how much more does what you do cost than sort of the plain vanilla stuff that basically creates a revolving door operation? One of them said, oh, let's say about $5,000 a trainee. The other one said nine, eight to $9,000. That's not a lot of money when you think about the type of money that goes into projects you know, in downtown, skyscrapers, or <laughs> arenas, <laughs> right. convention centers, yeah. stadiums, all kinds of stuff that people find money for when they want it badly enough. And you can see Stephen's full interview with Alan on our website. Just check it out there. And finally, we want to introduce you to Detroit CIO Chief Information Officer Beth Niblock. It was five years ago this month that Mayor Duggan recruited her from Kentucky to take the job turning around the city's antiquated IT systems. From office emails to paying parking tickets and water bills to systems that track crime to open data. We have an inside look at how she and her staff of 136 have been working to change the way people interact with the city and can connect. So we just head on in here. It must have been overwhelming when you first walked into this and saying, oh my gosh, we're, we're back in the 80s or? In some cases that would have been good. I mean, our payroll system got put in in 1978 and we're now in the process of, we've converted part of us to that and we're in the process hopefully by the end of the year to be completely off of that. Um, so in some cases, 80s was advanced. Um, I also think I felt like I had a better idea of what I was walking into because I was part of the team that the Obama administration brought in of municipal CIOs to come in and talk about what we could do, what could be done in Detroit with technology. So I felt like I knew and then you get here and then there's like, oh. And you have $90 million worth of projects right. to immediately get started on. What exactly were those projects? So, so in some cases, they were really very fundamental, like replacing all the desktops because they were so old we couldn't put security patches on them. People were on different versions of Microsoft Office. So if you got the email, which there was a lot of issues with the email system not working, so it was perfectly legitimate for somebody to say, I never got that email. 
So, you know, you're talking about the inner kind of communication of the inner workings of City Hall, but then starting to interface with the public to making sure that the accessibility to the city and city services was much easier than it had been for years. That was exactly the plan. What do we need to do internally so that we can have access to the computers and technology and we can email and we have new systems? Because the whole point is so that we can better serve our citizens. The mayor obviously is very committed to the cameras in the corridor, so we're doing a lot with uh, cameras so that we're able to, you know, really curtail illegal dumping, which is, you know, has been a, a big issue. We put in body cameras, integrated body cameras for police, so in their in-vehicle cameras and their cameras that they wear work in conjunction with one another. We put in, obviously, a new uh, computer-aided dispatch and 911 system. We brought up a new 911 center. We put in a new jail management system, a new fire and EMS records management systems. We've got the online permitting system that went live in December. We have online electronic plan review systems uh, through the Detroit Water and Sewer as well as DTE. We've got all the DivDAT machines that are in CVSs. So, you know, there are a lot of folks that pay cash for, and we don't want them to have to come downtown to pay their taxes or their water bills. So there, we've got DivDAP machines um, all over Detroit and some in other counties where you can go in and you can pull it up and you can pay your administrative hearing fees, your water bill, your electricity bill, uh, your DTE bill, um, or any, anything else. How does transparency and having that kind of data available to people in the city, how does that change the way they view government, do you think? Or how does that help them interact with the city more? Well, one, I think it's the people's data. And so it used to be very hard to get information from us. You would have to go through the FOIA process to get data. I mean, for other things, you still have to do that. But to get the data, it was very difficult to get it. And so by putting it out there, it gave us a place. Um, one, it says, here's your data. Mm -hmm. And two, I think it really gave us a, a same set of uh, starting point. So it would be that government would come into the room, we had a set of data, and the other, you know, the people we were working with may or may not have it. So it was interesting to me through our innovation team that does, puts all the data out there. We've had working groups with different neighborhood groups to say, here's the data that we're seeing about your neighborhood. Um, now on our website, we have an address finder, so you can put your address in and see all the data that government has about your address. There are some issues in that quality of that data, and we know it, and people take it really seriously. There's a feedback form on that site and said, hey, mm -hmm. I think there's a problem with this data, and we work with them to get the problems resolved. That was age 21. When we talk about technology and we make the assumption or you talk about people are able to access on mm -hmm. mobile devices, a lot of people do not have that connectivity in the city Absolutely. of Detroit. Give us a sense of the, of the problem and, and give me a sense of what the city is planning to do about it. Right now, depending on which study you read, between 40 and 60 percent of Detroiters do not have broadband in their home. Um, and 40 percent of Detroiters don't have data plans on their phones. So that's a huge number. Uh, part of what we're trying to do is do things via text. So you, you will see like on demolitions or on when we had to open warming centers or if you want to know when to set out your garbage or recycling, you can do all that via text because a lot of folks have unlimited text plans. So you can text, you can call, or you can come to the website. We have Wi-Fi now that we've committed to as a small teensy, like the tini tiniest little step of putting Wi-Fi throughout all of our recreation centers so people that c come in and spend a lot of time there have connectivity there. We um, put connectivity at Rosa Parks Bus Center. We're working on putting it because Detroiters spend a lot of time in transit, so as you're waiting, you can do that. Um, we're looking at putting it in at state fairgrounds. We, we are doing a pilot right now with the buses to have Wi-Fi on the buses. We can't leave Detroiters behind. Um, so we've got to give kids, especially, you've got a lot of kids that go to the library or, or their parents drive them up outside the library to try to connect to, to be able to do things. And we've just got to take that barrier away and, and do better. And that's going to do it for One Detroit. Next week we'll be at the Detroit Policy Conference. We hope you join us then. Thanks so much to the Black Lotus Brewery in Clawson for having us. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next Thursday. Take care.
Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marilat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at strongermichigan.com. Support also provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and the Bill and Shirley Fox Fund for Leadership and Public Affairs Programming at Detroit Public TV.